Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, first up, uh, <coughs> you're going to have to uh, excuse me if I uh, uh, every so often have to blow my nose because my uh, allergies are playing up somewhat. So we're going to talk about uh, Postgres and Redis, and uh, uh, we'll get, uh, we'll look at uh, here, here's basically what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about a bit about what Redis is and how it works. Then we'll take a look at the uh, Redis foreign data wrapper. Um, then we'll look at a companion uh, a package which wraps Redis command uh, API. Uh, and uh, finally, we're going to have a look at a case study of, uh, of a high-performance ad server that's based on, use, on a combination of Postgres and Redis and uses these utilities. Um, Redis is a high-performance in-memory key-value data store. Now, it, does, it will actually write to disk every so often, and how it does that is configurable. And it also has some replication features, which I won't be covering here. Um, but essentially, this is, this is what it is. It's, it's a pretty simple um, uh, uh, data store. The nice thing about it, the, the, uh, the the thing about it that makes it attractive for use with uh, with Postgres is that the, is that it does have some structured data types, as we'll see. It has almost no configuration required to set it up. That's the commands you need to do on a Fedora instance uh, recently, uh, a recent Fedora instance to install it, run it, and and get into uh, talking to it. The last is, is just the command line client for talking to Redis. That's, and, and that's all you have to do. There's pretty much, now, when you get to production, you're, gonna, you're going to tune it a bit. Principally, you're going to tune how much memory it uses. But uh, to, to start off with, that's all you need to do. It's very, very simple. Redis is, as I said, it's a key value data store. And the keys are just strings. That's all they are. But the values are rather different. They can be scalar values. They can be uh, strings. Or they can be integers. So you have increment operations, which are you know, useful for doing things like web counters and so on. And they can also be structured. And these are the four structures that they support. They have lists of things. They have unordered sets of things. They have ordered sets of things. And, and in effect, these are actually scored uh, uh, data. So that you can insert a value into these things along with uh, some score. which And then the ordering is according to the score. And you can get back that score. Um, and, uh, but, and the last thing they have is a, a single value can consist of a set of name value pairs. Uh, somewhat like an H store. Yeah? Uh, so if I want to represent a billion number, is it a string or Pretty much, I believe, yeah. I don't think we're actually doing any of that, but <laughs> I think that is, yeah. Um, so, uh, and these, these hashes, uh, play a, a big part in the way that uh, we're using the uh, Redis to uh, um, Redis in conjunction with, uh, with Postgres. There's a very simple command set. The, it's, this command set is unfortunately quite large, but all the commands are very simple. There's nothing like, uh, like SQL. Uh, it's basically uh, a command and uh, a few parameters. Uh, that's the URL where you can go and have a look at the command set if you're interested. Here are some examples. So the first example is setting a scalar value. You simply say set the name of the uh, the, the name of the object and the value of the object. The second uh, command is setting some values on uh, a hash key. Uh, so this is simply an arbitrary name and then a set of, of uh, 
property name value pairs. The third is adding some values to a set. The fourth is adding some values to the end of a list. And the fifth is setting uh, some values in an ordered set. These, uh, uh, the, the scores, by the way, can be uh, floating point numbers. They don't have to be integers. Okay. There is no creation command for a Redis object. You simply, uh, it, it springs into existence when you, uh, when you add some value to it. So it's almost schemaless. The only thing is that if you try to use a, a list operation on a set or something like that, then it, uh, then it objects. But apart from that, um, uh, Redis is pretty much totally schemaless. All right, and we have a single global namespace for all the objects of all types. So you can't have two objects of different type with the same name. Every object has to have, its, have, its, have a unique name. So, uh, yeah, people tend to build unique names by, you know, along this sort of pattern. Um, one of the things that, one of the things you can do is this, key, is this command, keys, which will find all the, uh, all the keys that match a particular uh, pattern. It's using uh, type globbing type patterns. Um, the Redis, uh, was, uh, the Redis um, documents actually warn against using this command in production. And uh, we'll see uh, later on how to get around um, uh, this, uh, this problem by using a different uh, command to find the keys that we're going to need. Okay, so Redis users basically uh, do, in effect, uh, tables, that is to say, segregate uh, uh, the, the global namespace into particular uh, um, uh, portions by either they use a prefix, so that they'll, uh, you know, they'll put a date on or they'll put a session ID on this part of the key or something or other which is going to, uh, going to segregate uh, that, and then they use, use uh, the keys command that we talk about. Or what they do is, is, is this. They keep the keys in a separate set. So you might uh, have a name set called key hit set. You're going to add your key to that, and then if you want to go and find all the keys that are in your set, instead of using the keys command, you'll simply get the, the members from this set, which is a very fast operation, um, and process that. But the downside is that the application has to make use of that. Redis itself is unable to match up the members of a set, or indeed the values returned by, uh, by the keys command, to anything else. So your application has to do all the work there. Okay, there is a, uh, a client library which uh, the Redis uh, community has produced. It's called Hi Redis. It's pretty simple, and it's available on GitHub. Um, so the Redis foreign data wrapper is uh, something Dave Page wrote to start with uh, uh, several years ago, and uh, Back in the uh, the nine one days when we were first starting off with da with uh, data wrappers, and recently it's been uh, brought up to date so that it runs with Postgres nine two and somewhat extended by me. And uh, recently we moved it from Dave's personal GitHub space into this uh, this uh, more generic name. Uh, so that's that that is now the uh, authoritative source for the foreign data wrapper. Um, 
The tip of it, by the way, is currently broken. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the, the breakage in, in, uh, when I get to, when I tell you the latest stuff I've done uh, in a while. Okay. So originally, basically, it only supported the scalar data type. It simply ignored everything else and, and said, oh, well, it's not a scalar. I'm, um, I'm not going to give you uh, back anything. And it had no support for uh, uh, segmenting the, the namespace in any way. So basically, it treated the whole Redis uh, namespace as a single table. And about the only thing you could do is you could say, well, I, wa I want just that one key. So it would actually push down a qual from, from Postgres on, on the key name for equality only. Um, and if it did that, then it would actually go and, and just fetch that key and uh, not give you back all the rows. Otherwise, it would give you back all the rows, and it was up to Postgres to apply any wear conditions. Uh, but of course, that might mean you get a whole lot of uh, data back from Redis, and then you, uh, uh, you're having to filter them on the Postgres site. So uh, starting around last December, um, I started uh, uh, doing some, some of these updates. Uh, the first thing I did was to uh, make it work with Postgres 9.2. And then I, we started uh, uh, work. All the data types are now supported. So you can have a table that will deal with set objects, or list objects, or hash objects, or ordered set objects, as well as with scalar objects. The second uh, thing we did was to uh, provide an option where you could specify the prefix for a set of keys for the table. So that then your table is only, you know, if you say that the prefix is, you know, uh, hits colon, then it will only fetch keys with, that, with names that match uh, that as a prefix. Or it can use the table sets uh, uh, functionality that we talked about before. You provide the name of a set, and then the keys of the table are the values contained in that set. <coughs> if the data comes, if there's, uh, uh, for, all the, for everything except scalars, the data comes back as an array, and that's actually returned as a Postgres array literal. So if you actually define the table as, as being a, uh, an array of text, say, then it will actually break that, uh, break that up into uh, an array of text, which you can then index. And we use that in a variety of ways. Okay, so hash tables are the most important type because really they map most closely to um, Postgres records. Right? A Postgres record is essentially a, uh, uh, a mapping from a set of names, column names, to a set of values. Um, so uh, a Redis uh, hash is exactly like a row in that respect. So if, you if you're using a hash type table, then the best thing is to define the table as having an array of text as the second column. And then what you can actually do is it's possible to turn that into a JSON or HStore or indeed to a record. So here's an example. Uh, we're going to take this, we're going to create a foreign table called Web Sessions, which is going to have a key. All, all these tables pretty much have to have one or two uh, columns, a key and, a, and, a, and an array of text. We see that the table type is called hash, and we're using the prefix method to, to choose which keys we want. And we can simply select star from web sessions, and we'll get a bunch of sessions, one row per session. So. To use that with an HStore, what we can do is we can, because HStore has the ability to turn uh, an array of key value pairs into a record, 
We could create a record type, for instance, which has these properties, ID, browser, and username. And then we use HStore's populate record to turn that into records of this type. This works pretty well. Um, there's also a new uh, 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 packet extension, which I recently wrote, called JSON object, which pretty much does the same thing as HStore's JSON re uh, HStore's populate record, but it does it from uh, 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 sorry. This actually it turns turns this into uh, a JSON object. So if you act, if what you want is a JSON object <coughs> rather than an HStore or record, you can actually uh, create one uh, from this. And of course, uh, in nine point three, we have uh, functions to turn JSON into records as part of that's part of the new JSON web. Okay. So here's the thing. Don't ever use the key prefix in production. Uh, the ad server that we're going to talk about, um, they, they, uh, they actually tried. That was the first pattern they wanted to use, and they did. And they, they sort of said, well, we don't want to bother with having to keep the keys in a key set. And then they came to me a couple of weeks later and said, but it's not performing very well. I said, well, how, what, what, what's gonna, what happens if you try uh, with a key set? And suddenly, magically, it just worked really fast. Uh, all they had to do was, to, uh, was uh, as they were you know, setting the values, they would also do S add on the key. And then when they fetched it, it was just very fast. This is the pattern that is actually recommended by the Redis docs. They say, don't use keys, use sets of keys. OK. The other thing you can do is because you can, you can actually use uh, sets of keys as a kind of where filter on, um, on a table. So you can actually def you could, uh, put the keys you want in a, uh, in a Redis set, define a table which used that set as its key set, and then pull that back. And that effect will subset your uh, the data that you, you want. And they are actually using this in the ad server. Um, it works pretty well. Um, we don't actually have support for high, uh, f for a lot of uh, uh, push down still in the, in the foreign data wrapper. So you need, you're going to need to use these sorts of tricks, at, the, at least at the moment, um, if somebody wants to, wants to fund uh, push down, we can have a look at it, but um, there's, we don't have any plans on the table for that. OK, so as I mentioned, in 9.3, we've got JSON populate record, which means you could avoid the use of HStore if you want to turn stuff into uh, a record. Um, post 9.3, it pro would probably be a good idea to have uh, something which didn't actually have to use these intermediate types, JSON or HStore, to create a record, and we, we should have a function either in core or as an extension which would uh, take an array of key value pairs and simply produce a record of the required type directly. Uh, that would be quite possible, and it's probably worth doing. Um, in fact, it's probably worth having in core. It, it's a su sufficiently uh, general use. It would certainly be useful uh, for use with the Redis. Uh, data wrapper. OK, here's the thing I wrote recently, which, uh, uh, and which has uh, currently caused the data wrapper to be broken. Um, the, for, the Redis foreign data wrapper currently uh, treats um, uh, every JSON, uh, every Redis um, va uh, value set as a table row. But what if we actually treated it as being a table instead of a row? And the classic case for doing this would be uh, sets or lists. Um, so what you can actually do is, uh, when I, or what you will be able to do when I unbreak this, is um, 
is define a, a Postgres table to, to correspond to a single um, Redis object and then get uh, the values in that object back as a set of rows. Uh, that has all sorts of uh, possible use, useful values. So the, the, the uh, uh, sets and lists will simply come back as, as single field uh, 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 rows. Hashes are going to come back as, as key value rows two, with two fields. And ordered sets, you can, you, you can choose one or two fields. Uh, if, you choose, if you have two fields, the second is going to be the score that uh, corresponds to the, uh, the value in the ordered set. Um, and particularly after my experiences of the last couple of days, so I now know how to write uh, writable foreign data wrappers after the black hole experience. Um, <clears throat> not that that required a lot of code. Um, the, um, I'm, I'm planning to uh, uh, start work very soon on uh, having the, the Redis foreign data wrapper able, able to write values back to Redis. But in the meanwhile, we can't do that, and we certainly can't do it in Postgres 9.2, uh, which doesn't have support for writable uh, foreign data wrappers anyway. So uh, what, we've, uh, what we've done is we've wrapped that, that uh, library, that, which is also used in the foreign data, the high Redis library. We've wrapped its functionality in some Postgres functions, which are fairly simple. Uh, this work was sponsored by IVC, who are the, the creators of the, uh, the, um, the ad server. And it's, uh, it's available on their Bitbucket um, uh, repo. And it basically has four functions. Redis connect, Redis disconnect, Redis command, and Redis argv. Now, the Redis foreign data wrapper makes a command for e every time you select. It doesn't, it doesn't keep persistent connections hanging around. But this is really designed for much lower level operations. So we didn't want to be having to connect and disconnect every time you um, uh, push a single value. You might want to push a million values from a table and you didn't want to have, I didn't want to be having to uh, make a connection on, and break a connection for every, every, va every single value that I was pushing to Redis. So basically what you can do, uh, what you have to do when you're using this library is to set up a handle using Redis connect. You then use that handle in the Redis command and Redis arg command argv uh, commands and then when you're finished you disconnect. I don't know of anything in the certainly in the foreign data wrapper API. I mean, basically, it, it sets up. Uh, I mean, you got to remember once once you've got that, you 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 from the point of view of uh, Postgres, you've just basically got a table. Uh, so everything has to be handled inside the foreign data wrapper code. I don't know of anything that would give, would give you access to arbitrary commands. So even when we get writable, uh, writable uh, foreign uh, uh, data wrappers, there's probably still going to be some value in this library because you're going to be able to, uh, you know, to do things like uh, flush all if you want to to delete uh, um, you know, to, to clean out the database and that sort of stuff. Uh, some to, to, to get access to the utility commands of Redis. Okay, so the first argument to uh, Redis Connect is a handle. It's basic. It's an arbitrary integer which you choose. It's a number. It needs to be a number between zero and fifteen. In fact, 
uh, and it's simply an index into an array. It's an extremely lazy way to do it, and uh, uh, so I apologize for that. I probably ought to uh, uh, fix it and make it a, a fancier name and then look that up in a hash table, but I don't right now because I was in a hurry. Um, <clears throat> the, all the remaining arguments are optional. They all default to something. Uh, the, the, so normally what you want, if you're running on the local host and you're running on with, with Redis database 0, de Redis databases are also named 0 through to 15, by the way, um, if, uh, is uh, you can simply give it the handle name that you want and uh, then use the defaults. Ignore duplicate says if we've already created a handle with this, uh, with this don't, don't object, just return. Um, and that was found useful by IVC in um, some of their code. Excuse me. Okay. As I, as I mentioned, uh, these are persistent connections, so you need to set them up and break them down explicitly. So th these other things are, uh, are uh, basically very thin layers over the, uh, uh, the library uh, uh, functions with, which have almost identical names. Um, the diff if you want to use one, just use redis command argv. Redis command is the first one I wrote, uh, but unfortunately mapping uh, uh, this doesn't work terribly well with uh, variadic C functions. Um, and so Redis command argv, where you actually pass an explicit um, uh, uh, vector of arguments terminated by an, uh, of, oh, with a, yeah, terminated by a null, I believe. And uh, that works a whole lot better. Um, so Redis command, you can only have four arguments, up to four arguments after the command string. If you need more than that, then it, it objects. At the moment, they're text values, but I might switch it from using variadic text to variadic any. I wasn't actually all that familiar with variadic any at the time I wrote this originally. Um, I've since become familiar with it and done one or two things with it, uh, particularly in the JSON space. Um, and... Um, it has certain limitations, but I don't think they particularly apply in this case, um, and uh, would make it uh, a lot easier so that you wouldn't have to cast things to text. I know J uh, Josh found that with one of the other utilities I wrote, that it was a whole lot better when we used variadic any. Okay, so the uses are to push data into Redis and also to run utility statements. And it's being used for both of those things in the ad server. So I'm also, uh, I've also added in um, uh, the ability to uh, 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 push a record. And basically what this, can, this will do is it will pull all the data out of the record without you actually having to name it explicitly and manipulate that. You can tell it... Um, you can just pass in the record. You can tell it if you want to push the keys, which you normally do. Uh, you can tell it the key set you want the, uh, the keys added to. Uh, you can tell it what the prefix is going to be and what the, what the, what the, the key fields are in the, uh, in the record. And then your record could be you know, hundreds of uh, variables long, and you wouldn't have to uh, do anything. It would just set that. Um, this is basically for pushing a hash table. It's not, uh, and it will set up the key set for you as well as if you uh, uh, don't pass uh, null in here, um, as well as uh, all the, uh, the hash rows. So it works quite nicely. Um, at the moment, um, uh, this is not in use, but and they're actually uh, uh, doing some looping code in and uh, in PLPGSQL. Uh, this is going to make life a whole lot simpler in the ad server code. Okay, so why use Redis? Well, it's fast. It's actually really fast. 
Um, it's not terribly safe. Um, its notion of transactions is uh, almost non-existent and where, to the extent that it's existent, it doesn't make terribly much sense. So, um, at least not in, in relational terms. So, uh, it's, useful, it's useful for certain types of data. If it's, uh, uh, if it's data that you can afford to lose, or at least to lose a little bit of, um, then it's certainly uh, useful. One of the re and one, the real reason is that, uh, given the uh, constraints of the project that we were working on, um, we could not have achieved the performance ga uh, uh, goals by simply by stashing all the data in Postgres. We would have overwhelmed the system. So the use case is an ad server. Uh, and basically, our attitude was, you know, if Redis, if Redis crashes, it's not a tragedy. But if the whole system is slow, then it is a tragedy. Because all our customers are going to leave if we don't serve the ads back really fast. So this, is, this project was uh, <coughs> created by IVC. It was done pretty much on a shoestring. And uh, they're a, a sort of small boutique um, software house in Cary, North Carolina, that I've worked with for quite a few years. They've sponsored a number of uh, extremely useful um, Postgres uh, developments, such as extensible enums. Um, and they're a bunch of good people. So most of these slides are uh, based on information from them. So here are the system goals that they had. Uh, they need to be able to serve 10,000 ads per second uh, per CPU. So they're actually running on uh, eight core machines uh, in the database. So that's 80,000 per second. Um, <clears throat> they're using uh, some old hardware that they managed to acquire very cheaply. They, were, they did not want to spend up big on hardware and overcome the, the lim limitations by running on super fast hardware. The timing constraints are that they need to be able to answer the, 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 this. The system is designed to answer the, the question of which ad in two stages. The first stage is actually answered from Postgres. And what it does is it says, what are the ads we can legally uh, supply to comply with this request. And it comes up with a list of around about 30. The second um, uh, question it answers is, of those 30, which one is, is going to be the best to serve based on statistical analysis of what ads have recently been served in this particular area and which ones are actually going to pay the best um, because it's based on pricing and, and uh, uh, there's a, a fairly complex algorithm which is applied. That answer is computed from the data that is held in Redis. It records the ad requests, the confirmations, and the clicks. And it it's, uh, pretty much uh, needs to be a 24-7 operation. So here's a physical view of the system. Uh, essentially, we have these four systems at the bottom. They're, they're Dell 2950s, which are not high-end machines, right? Uh, uh, they don't have a huge amount of memory. Um, two of those uh, run the run run. Um, the run, they all run, all of these run Postgres databases. Two of them run the database and a hot standby for answering that first question. And two of them run the, uh, the back end system, the data warehouse in effect that, that does all the analytics and the billing and the back office support. Everything else runs on virtual hosts run from these uh, uh, Zen hosts uh, out on the right hand side. And, and that includes Redis. Redis is running out there. Um, Redis is actually chewing up almost all of that 128 gigabytes. Uh, on two instances on, on each, one on each of those uh, uh, Zen hosts, and it runs with about, I think, 97 gigabytes of memory. Okay, here's a logical view. 
in this, uh, of how it works. Um, <clears throat> the system is, uh, the front end is, uh, the, the ads are actually served out of Nginx, um, which uh, deals with the file system, uh, pulls the, the ads straight off the file system. The, um, the queries come in through into Node.js, which, which was found to be extremely fast. Um, it talks to Postgres up the top and then to Redis here and answers that query. And it's, it's answering that query in about 10 to, 10 to 12 milliseconds per query. Um, the transactional database holds only two tables. And um, it's, we actually construct those two tables every 10 minutes. And they're constructed in the business database, which is a conventional OLTP type system. We construct that. We push, push that data out to the transactional database in its highly denormalized form. Uh, we build the indexes there, and then we simply swap it for the old one using a rename. And that provides pretty much no interruption whatsoever. We have not noticed any slowdown at all as we're doing the rename. It's working very well. We also replicate some data into the data warehouse from the business database for doing the business analytics. And that is done on a selective basis using Londis 3 out of the Sky Tools. So there we are. We have six Postgres databases. As I think I've pretty much just about covered this slide in what I just said. Yeah, oh, the other, the other piece of this is that, that uh, we have PG pool load balancers over the transactional database uh, and fail over. And if anything else falls over, uh, it's not a tragedy. But if, if the transactional database falls over, then we're not serving ads anymore and we're losing money. So. Um, it's, uh, and they've tried uh, quite a lot of stuff to, uh, to make it fall over. They've you know, pulled, pulled plugs and uh, uh, crashed machines in various ways, and it's still stayed up. It's, it's fairly robust. OK, so the business database, as I said, is, uh, uh, is pretty conventional uh, OLTP type uh, system. It's, it's a, a fairly normalized system. We've got uh, tables for ads and advertisers and publishers and IP locations and, and, and stuff. Uh, there's only a handful of users ever touch this database, which, which are our business customers. That is to say, the people who publish our ads and the people who advertise. Um, but they actually tried, uh, in the first instance, serving, um, serving the ad, ad requests direct out of this database. They did not get to first base. They could not uh, sustain anything like the load that was necessary, certainly not with the hardware that they had on hand. So we push, we push these materialized views out to, uh, in effect, uh, out to the ad serving database. One of the keys to this is that we are using some very, uh, we use Postgres advanced data types a lot. Um, you know, the size of an ad is a Postgres geometric type. It's a box. Um, this, the, um, w there's uh, extensive use of arrays of various types. We use some text search vectors and text search queries uh, to match keywords. Um, and uh, we use GIN. We, I think we've got just about every database uh, that Postgres, uh, every index type that Postgres supports all on the one table. Um, and it's, it's all working actually extremely well. The, um, they don't know whether or not they can actually, they've tried stressing this. And what, on the current setup, what happened was that they were actually able to saturate their network pipe before they were able to stress the system. So they don't know what the actual stress point of the system is yet. So there's, here's the, the ad-serving database, as I said. We, we simply copy the data in this very denormalized form every three minutes, okay, um, and then create the indexes and swap them out. 
and they are absolutely convinced that this could not be done uh, without Postgres. They're extremely, uh, they're, they're very Postgres friendly and they wanted me to tell you that. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So we're getting, let's say we're getting 10,000 uh, impressions per second. Um, all of these impressions are actually going into Redis. And then they're pulled from Redis uh, in batches using that using the foreign data wrapper and the set model <coughs> uh, every six minutes for statistical analysis. Um, if they'd been doing this with individual inserts into, into Postgres, it would have been uh, overwhelming. They couldn't have done it. <coughs> they use uh, uh, partitioning and uh, 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 to, uh, to run their nightly batch processing to uh, produce the... Uh, um, produce billing reports and other statistical analysis. Um, and um, again, they're extremely grateful for the way that partitioning works with Postgres. They think it works very well for them. Okay, the... Uh, <coughs> oh, one other thing, the... Impressions are not stored in, direct into Postgres, but they, that's not where the money is. The money in, in serving ads is when people actually click on an ad. That data is actually recorded straight into the recording database, as well as into Redis. Uh, but that's only a tiny fraction of the, of the traffic because, you know, you bring up a web page, you're going to see a hundred ads, and most most often you're not going to click on any of them. So uh, clicks don't account for very much, but impressions are all, almost all the traffic. But of course, you might pay one cent per thousand for impressions, whereas you might pay fifty cents or a dollar for a click. Okay, so basically, the, this recording database does all the uh, uh, all the back office processing. Um, they initially tried uh, pulling this data from the data in the in the business database that they required in using um, using DB Link. They found that was way too slow, and so they replicate that data in using Sky Tools, and it's uh, it's a lot faster. Um, Fraud detection. Fraud detection is actually a major issue in ad serving. Um, there's a considerable incentive on publishers to uh, generate clicks on the on the ads that they're publishing so that they get some revenue. Uh, and you need to be able to analyze the the, uh, the patterns of impressions and clicks. Um, in order to prevent fraud. Uh, this is actually done in two, two stages. Firstly, uh, they have some fraud detection that is running pretty much in real time against the Redis database and uh, where, where the clicks are initially stored. Uh, they also do uh, longer term uh, fraud detection in the recording database because they only keep basically a day's worth of, of uh, clicks at any one time, of impressions at any one time in the Redis database. Um, they clean it out pretty regularly. That means you need to store a lot of data in the, in the recording database. OK, so we, we know pretty much this. This is telling us what we already know here. The, in, in the ad server, as I say, the, the, uh, 94 of the 128 gigabytes on each of those Zen hosts is dedicated to the Redis VM. And almost all of that is used by Redis. It's, Redis is the only thing that runs on its VM. <coughs> so they found that this uh, um, that the stuff that we did was a lot faster and a lot e made life a lot easier for them than um, 
than if they'd had to write this uh, uh, themselves and they found good performance characteristics from it. Okay, so the stuff going the other way, we actually need to, uh, one of the things that you need when you're making a decision about which ad to serve is what are the prices that are being paid for impressions and clicks because that helps you to decide with, whether you serve this ad or that ad. And so that, act, that actually gets pushed from the business database into Redis so that you can make the decision in Redis. <clears throat> or, the, or the Redis client, in effect, can make the decision. <clears throat> and the, on the other hand, the data, the impression and click data is pulled from Redis into the recording database via the foreign data wrapper. So we have interaction both ways. They, this has been in um, production since March, scaling pretty well, as I said, uh, um, and um, it, it, was, it was done on a shoestring. They pretty much two guys with some help from me did this in the space of three months. So here are their conclusions. Rich data types, absolutely essential, couldn't have done without them. Rich, the indexes the, and the different index types helped them a lot. Interaction, good interaction between Redis and Postgres. Essentially, we're using Redis to do what Redis does well and Postgres to do what Postgres does well. This is the, this is the key to uh, good hybrid systems. I'm convinced that we're going to see more and more hybrid systems of this kind. Uh, Picking one tool to do all the work is probably uh, not going to cut it for a whole lot of applications, and you're going, to, you're going to see people combining different sorts of data stores for different sorts of uses here. Uh, somebody else was telling me about using Postgres with Hadoop the other day, and, and uh, we're seeing a number of cases of that and so on. Node.js uh, is very fast. Its concurrency is, is superb, and they... Uh, they're pretty much in love with it. And they, they, the costing, they think that their development cost was approximately 2% of what, the, what a commercial uh, alternative would have cost. them. It's all open source. So, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Node.js is essentially answering all the dynamic questions. So the only thing that Nginx is doing is actually serving the, the, the ad. In other words, the answer comes back from Node.js and says, this is the ad to serve, and then Nginx pushes it out. Um, the actual query is handed off by Nginx to Node.js, and, and the, whole, the whole app is written as a Node.js app. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a little bit unclear on some of the modeling of Redis. You mentioned the high Redis library. Mm -hmm. Redis itself provides a, like a tongue explanation uh, language to it. Can you comment on this maybe? Um, <coughs> not sure what the wire protocol is to tell you the truth, but it's probably something fairly fairly much like that. Okay, I, I saw some examples like that on the, the website for Redis. So I was trying to understand whether you could write an application and you could connect Redis to an API or whether it's always going to be a, a complete thing.
Mm-hmm. You're pushing everything to sorted steps. Right. Um, the question is, um, the Redis wrapper mm-hmm. um, has a connection model. What happens if Redis goes away for no good reason? Um, you're going to get an error. It, I mean, it, it, all, the, all these commands check that yeah. you can talk to Redis, and they throw a, a Postgres exception. Um, so, you know, the thing comes in and it says, okay, have I got a connection? No, I haven't got a connection. You know, e-report error. Okay, now I'm going to run this command. Well, if, I, if, if that didn't work, I'm, you know, I'll get the, the, uh, the result back in e-report error. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's probably worth looking at to see whether we could. Um, the trouble, uh, the trouble with not uh, not doing ephemeral connections is that we would have to have some API to to make them persist. Um, now maybe, and, and you know, there's nothing in the foreign data wrapper model which actually which actually uh, would do that. But I'd, that might not be a, a, an objection. We could, you know, it might be that we could simply say, well, if there's a, if there's a connection there, use it. And if not, connect or something like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we might be able to do it. And maybe we could say, you know, use a. Um, uh, it could be an option on the t- on the foreign table. It says, says you know, use persistent foo or whatever. And then if 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 foo hadn't been set up, you would set it up. And if it ha- had, you would just use it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably worth doing. Yeah, no. I mean, no, no, no. There's there's no nesting of of data types. At all, um, yeah. It's yeah. It's basically a key value store. Yeah, yeah. You said the personal collection is done directly in Postgres. You said about thirty. Yep. Not sure to tell you the truth. I haven't written that part of it. Okay. All right.